Chapter 35, American Pageant. The Cold War Begins. What was decided at the Yalta Conference in February 1945? Chapter Introduction. The United States at this moment was at the summit of the world. American people, 140 million strong, cheered the nation's victories in Europe and Asia, the conclusion of World War II. Before the shouting had even faded, many Americans began to worry about their future. Four fear fiery years of the global war had not entirely driven from their minds the painful memories of 12 desperate years of the Great Depression Still more ominously, victory celebrations had barely ended before America's crumbling relations with its wartime ally, the Soviet Union, threatened a new and even more terrible international conflict. Truman, the gutty man from Missouri. Presiding over the opening of the post-war period was an excellent president, Harry S. Truman. Trim and obviously bespectacled with his graying hair and friendly toothy grin, Truman was called the average man's average man. Even his height, five feet eight inches, was average. The first president in many years without a college education, he had farmed, served as an artillery officer in France during World War I, and failed as a haberdasher. He then tried his hand at precinct level Missouri politics, through which he rose from a judgeship to the U.S. Senate. Though protege, a protege of notorious political machine in Kansas City, he had managed to keep his own hands clean. The problems of the post-war period were staggering, and a suddenly burdened new president at first approached his task with humility, but gradually he evolved from a shrinking pipsqueak into a scrappy little cuss, gaining confidence to the point of cockiness. When the Soviet foreign minister complained, I'd never been taught to like that, I'd never been talked to, in, to like that in my life, Truman shot back. Carry out your agreements, and you won't get talked to like that. Truman later boasted, I gave him the one, two, right to the jaw. A smallish man thrust suddenly into a giant job. Truman permitted designing old associates of the Missouri gang to gather around him. And like Grant was stubbornly loyal to them, when they were caught with cream on their whiskers on occasion, he would send critics hot-tempered and profane, SOB letters. Most troubling, he was inclined to go half-cocked or stick mostly to a wrong-headed notion. To err is human, cynics jibed. But if he was sometimes small in small things, he was often big in big things. He had down-home authenticity, few pretensions, rock-solid probity, and a lot of that old-fashioned character trait called moxie. Not one to dodge responsibility, he placed a sign on his White House desk that read, The buck stops here. Among his favorite sayings was, If you can stand the heat, get out the kitchen. His metal would be tested as tensions with Russia heated up. So the section is very important because what it's doing is it's introducing Harry Truman, uh, who would be the president, first president during the Cold War. Uh, it's kind of just portraying him as someone that's, uh, you know, it starts off as kind of someone that lacks confidence, but by the end of this presidency, um, he wasn't willing to back down to anybody. Yalta, bargain or betrayal. Vast and silent. The Soviet Union continued to be the great enigma. The conference at Tehran in 1943, where Roosevelt first met Joseph Stalin man to man, had cleared the air somewhat, but much remained unresolved, especially questions about the post-war fates of Germany, Eastern Europe, and Asia. The Yalta Conference, the final fateful meet of the Big Three, took place in February 1945. At first, at this former Tsar's resort on the relatively warm shoes of the Black Sea, Stalin Churchill and the fast-failing Roosevelt, reached momentous agreements after pledging their faith with vodka. Final plans were laid for smashing uh, the buckling German lines and assigning occupation zones in Germany to the victorious powers. Stalin agreed that Poland, with revised boundaries, should have a representative government based on free elections, a pledge he spoke. Bulgaria and Romania were likewise to have free elections, a promise also flouted. The big three further announced plans for fashioning a new international peacekeeping organization called the United Nations. So as you can see here, there's a lot of things that are being done at this Yalta conference. Um, some of these are, of course, 
uh, setting uh, occupation zones in Germany. Once Germany is defeated, they're going to split it up. Stalin agrees to grant Poland um, with revised boundaries that represent the government and free elections. So they should be able to decide who their leader is. Um, Bulgaria and Romania, the same. And last but not least, you would also get the League of Nations. Of all the great decisions of Yalta, the most controversial one concerned the Far East. The atomic bomb had not yet been tested. And Washington strategists expected frightful American casualties in a projected assault on Japan. From Roosevelt's standpoint, it seemed highly desirable that Stalin should enter the Asian War, pin down Japanese troops in Manchuria and Korea, and lighten American losses. Stalin, striking a hard bargain, agreed to attack, to attack Japan within three months after the collapse of Germany. In return, the Soviets were promised the southern half of the Sakhalin Island, lost to Japan in 1905. Japan's Kuril Islands had control over the railroads and two key seaports in Chinese Manchuria, China's Manchuria. So during the Yalta conference, the atomic bomb was not yet developed. The United States is kind of hoping that Stalin and the Soviet Union would help assist defeat Japan after Germany loses. Uh, so of course it would save American lives. Uh, in exchange, of course, for this, um, Stalin would be given some territory lost in the uh, Russo-Japanese War of 1905. As it turned out, Moscow's mule was not necessary to knock out Japan. Critics charged that Roosevelt had sold Chiang Kai-shek down the river when he conceded control of Manchuria to Stalin. The consequent uh, undermining of Chinese morale, so accusation ran, contributed powerful Jiang's overthrow by the communists four years later. Critics also sailed the sell out of Poland and other Eastern European countries. Um, so remember during this time, Chinese civil war is going on. Zhang Zhaixi or Chiang Kai-shek, of course, was the ruler or the leader of the Nationalist Party. And with um, America giving some of that territory of Manchuria to Russia, it seems as if that the Nationalist Party was sold out. Roosevelt's defenders countered that, uh, countered that Stalin, with his mighty Red Army, could have secured much of China if he wished, and that the Yalta Conference really set limits on his ambitions. Apologists for Roosevelt also contended that if Stalin had kept his promise to support free elections in Poland and the Liberated Balkans, the future of the U.S.-Soviet relations would have looked different. At the time of Yalta, Soviet troops occupied much of Eastern Europe, and a war to throw them out was unthinkable. So some were saying that the Yalta Conference is actually a good idea because it limits Stalin. Stalin could have taken much of that area of Manchuria himself, and now it just came down to those free elections, which, of course, Stalin does not abide by. The fact is that the big three at Yalta were not drafting, drafting a comprehensive peace settlement. At most, they were sketching general intentions and testing one another's reactions. Later, critics who hauled about broken promises overlooked the fundamental point. More specific understandings among the wartime allies, especially the two emerging superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, away the rival of peace. So what they're looking at here is the Yalta Conference isn't necessarily a peace conference. Rather, it's almost like a game of poker. Uh, Soviet Union and the United States are trying to call each other's bluff so they can really get what they want. So what was decided at the Yalta Conference? Germany's would be set up in occupation zones and as well as free elections in Poland, Bulgaria, and Romania. In exchange, Soviet Union will help defeat Japan. Remember, this is all before the atomic bomb is created, though. The United States and the Soviet Union, what were some incidents that fueled Stalin's mistrust for the U.S.? History provided little hope that the United States and the Soviet Union would reach cordial understanding about the shape of the post-war world. Mutual suspicions were ancient, abundant, and abiding. Communism and capitalism were histor historically hostile social philosophies. The United States had refused officially to recognize the Bolshevik Revolution or revolutionary government in Moscow until it was 16 years old in 1933. Soviet skepticism towards the West was nourished by the British and American delays in opening up for a second front against Germany, while the Soviet army paid a grisly price to roll the Nazi invaders back across Russia and Eastern Europe. Britain and America had also frozen their Soviet ally out of the project to develop atomic weapons. Further, uh, feeding Stalin's mistrust. The Washington government rubbed salt in Soviet wounds when it abruptly uh, terminated via lend lease aid to battered USSR in 1945 and spurred Moscow's plea for $6 billion reconstruction loan 
while proving a similar loan of 3.75 to Great Britain. So a couple of things that's very problematic here. Of course, the Soviet Union is upset the United States for not acknowledging the Bolshevik Revolution, the communist government up until 1933. Uh, other reasons why they're upset is uh, lend-lease. Uh, they kind of refused to lend-lease uh, to the Soviet Union. However, they would go ahead and lend-lease to Great Britain. And at the same time, uh, the Soviet Union is very upset because it's taking a very long time for the United States and Great Britain to attack on the Western Front, which means more Soviet lives are lost. Different visions, visions of the post-world post -war world also separated the two superpowers. Stalin aimed, uh, aimed above all to guarantee the security of, of the Soviet Union. The USSR had twice in the 20th century been stabbed in its heartland by attacks across the windswept plains of Eastern Europe. Stalin made it clear from the outset of the war that he was determined to have friendly governments along the Soviet western border, especially in Poland. By maintaining an extensive Soviet sphere of influence in the Eastern and Central Europe, the USSR protects itself and consolidates its revolutionary base as the world's leading communist country. So in short, what this paragraph is saying that the Soviet Union has been attacked twice already uh, within the century, and that's from the Western Front, so they want to make sure they protect themselves in the West, meanwhile having a lot of influence in the East part of its border. To many Americans, that sphere of influence looked like an ill-gained empire. Doubting that Soviet goals were purely defensive, they remember the earlier Bolshevik call for world revolution. Stalin's emphasis on spears also clashed with Franklin Roosevelt's Wilsonian dream in the open world, decolonized, demilitarized, democratized, and a strong international organization to oversee global peace. So while Stalin seems as if he wants to build an empire in the east, third part of Europe, protect itself in the west, of course FDR is more Wilsonian. He wants to see world peace. Even the ways in which the United States and Soviet Union resembled each other were often troublesome. Both countries had been largely isolated from the world affairs before World War II. The United States through choice, Soviet Union through ejection by other powers. Both nations also had a history of conducting uh, missionary diplomacy, trying to export all the world, uh, trying to export to all the world the political doctrines precipitated by their respective revolutionary origins. Uncustomed to their great power roles, unfamiliar with with or even antagonistic to each other, and each believing in the universal applicability of its own particular ideology, America and the USSR suddenly found themselves staring eyeball to eyeball over the prostate body of a better Europe. In these circumstances, some sort of confrontation was virtually unavoidable. The wartime Grand Alliance of the United States, the Soviet Union, and Great Britain had been, had been a misbegotten child of necessity. When the hatred, when the hated Hitler fell, suspicion and rivalry between communistic, despotic, despotic Russia and capitalistic de democratic America were all but inevitable. In a faithful progression of events, marked even by misperceptions as well as by genuine conflicts of interest, the two powers provoked each other into a tense standoff known as the Cold War. So what this Cold War is, you're getting a standoff between the capitalist nation of the United States as well as the communist nation of Russia. Um, enduring four and a half decades, the Cold War not only shaped Soviet-American relations, it overshadowed the entire post-war international order in every corner of the world. So you're seeing this Cold War, uh, four to five, 45 year long diplomatic tension between the U.S. and Soviet Union to divide much of the world. So you're getting capitalism versus communism. It's trying to spread their influence, right, uh, in a war-torn Europe. So discuss the differing uh, visions of the post-war world. Uh, as stated, um, of course, you're looking at the Soviet vision. Soviet vision is um, you're looking at the West Coast is peaceful. Not the West Coast, but Western border of the Soviet Union is peaceful because they've already been attacked twice. You're seeing Soviet influence in the East, uh, more, more specifically spreading communism. While on the other hand, you're looking at the United States vision where you're looking at a peaceful uh, Wilsonian type of democracy that exists where popular sovereignty is allowed. And all these nations are now granted uh, the right to rule themselves through representat representative governments. Discuss how United States, uh, how United Nations differ from the League of Nations, shaping the post world. Despite these obstacles, the United States did manage at war's end to erect some of the structures that would support Roosevelt's vision in open world. The Atlantic Charter, 
that he and Churchill, probably late in 1941, proclaimed for all nations the rights to self-determination, free access to trade, while committing to a post-war international system designed to ensure the human rights to freedom from fear and want from all individuals everywhere. As victory approached, the Western Allies uh, worked to build institutions that would uh, embody those lofty goals. So this is talking about the Atlantic Charter, which of course is saying that people have the right to be sovereign and rule themselves. At the Bretton Woods Conference in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire in 1944, the Western Allies established the IMF to encourage world trade by regulating currency exchange rates. They also found the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the World Bank, to promote economic growth in war ravaged and underdeveloped areas. Three years later, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the GATT, reduced trade barriers among member nations and helped form the basis for a transformed spread of economic globalization in the latter half of the century, in contrast to its behavior after World War I. The United States took the lead in creating these um, important international bodies and supplied most of their funding. Victorious and robust at the end of the conflict had laid waste all the traditional great powers. America was uniquely positioned to shape the world order after World War II. The emerging world Cold War conflict, meanwhile, ensured that Soviets and those within their sphere of influence would largely decline to participate in many of the new multilateral institutions. Uh, so here we are getting a lot of organizations that are set up uh, to bring back stability and peace. You're getting the Brenton Woods Conference, uh, which establishes the IMF, which is going to uh, go ahead and encourage world trade by regulating currency exchange rates. Uh, you're getting the IMF, which is going to go ahead and, of course, promote ep economic growth um, to uh, underdeveloped areas by letting out loans, right? And the United States, of course, is the leader of all this going on, which is completely different from World War I, where we are more isolationist. The emerging global war extended international governance to realms beyond economics. This flags wept at half mast. The United Nations Conference opened on schedule, April 25, 1945, despite Roosevelt's dismaying death 13 days earlier. Unlike Woodrow Wilson with his League of Nations, Roosevelt had shrewdly moved to establish a new international body before the war's conclusion, so as to capitalize on the wartime spirit of corporation and insulate planning for the United Nations from potentially divisive issue of peace settlement. Meeting at the San Francisco War Memorial Opera House, representatives from 50 nations uh, fashioned the United Nations Charter. The United States took a leading role in reshaping and funding the organization, but in contrast to its abstention from other post-war economic institutions, the Soviet Union expected to be a key participant in this body. So uh, some of the differences from the UN versus the League of Nations, one major one is that the United States are actually part of it. Also, that the United Nations that she established still um, in during World War II, uh, the League of Nations was established after. The United Nations was a successor to the old League of Nations, but it differed from its predecessor in significant ways. Born in a moment of idealism, designates to prevent another great power, the League had adopted rules denying the veto power to any party to dispute. The UN, by contrast, more realistically, realistically provided that no member of this, no member of the Security Council dominated the Big Five powers. U.S., Britain, USSR, France, and China could have any action against it without its consent. The League, in short, presumed great power conflict. The UN presumed great power cooperation. Both approaches had their liabilities. The UN had also featured the General Assembly which would be controlled by smaller countries in contrast to the Chilean-American perception of the League in 1999. The Senate overwhelmingly approved the UN uh, by a vote of 892 because it provides safeguards for American sovereignty and freedom. A couple of differences, a couple of differences between the UN and the League of Nations. Uh, the United Nations, of course, is approved by the Senate. The League of Nations was not. The UN, right? Well, it says here the League had adopted denying the veto power to any party to dispute. So they're saying that the United Nations doesn't allow that. The United Nations doesn't allow for any party dispute. In fact, um, it provided no member of the Security Council dominated by the big five powers, the U.S., Britain, France, and China, could have taken action against it uh, without consent. So it's looking at Britain, USSR, France, China, United States, or the big five powers. Um, and to take action against it would be very difficult to do. Right? The UN also featured a General Assembly, 
which was controlled by smaller countries. On the other hand, the League of Nations did not have that. The United Nations setting up its permanent glass home in New York City has some gratifying initial assesses. Help preserve peace in Iran, Kashmir, and other trouble spots played a role in creating the new Jewish state of Israel. The UN trusteeship council uh, guided former colonies to imp- independence through uh, such arms as UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, the FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, and WHO, the World Health Organization. The UN bought, brought benefits to peoples uh, the world over, right? So through the UN, uh, it's a little bit different because it's has a lot, uh, I don't want to say more success than the League of Nations, but it's also developing uh, these minor organizations that are bringing stability into uh, nations that are not as developed. Here's some new technology of the atom. However, put an early test of spirit of cooperation on which the UN had been founded. The new organization failed its test badly. US den- the U.S. delegate Bernard Baruch called in 1946 for a UN uh, agency, free from the great power veto, without worldwide authority over atomic energy, weapons, and research. The Soviet delegate countered that the possession of nuclear weapons should simply be outlawed by every nation. President Truman said that it would be a folly to throw away our gun until we are sure the rest of the world can't arm against us. Suspicious Soviets felt the same way and used their veto power to scuttle the proposals. A priceless opportunity to attain the nuclear monster in its intimacy was lost. So what it's basically talking about there is the Soviet Union is calling to uh, end uh, nuclear warfare or to saying that no one should have it. But of course, the United States is saying we don't want to get rid of it. Because we fear that, you know, what else if someone has it? The problem of Germany. What was the purpose of the Nuremberg uh, war crimes trial? And why did Truman see the Berlin airlift as a necessity? The problem of Germany. Hitler's ruined Reich posed especially th- uh, thorny problems for all the wartime allies. They agreed that the cancer of Nazism had been cut out of the German body politic, which involved pushing Nazi leaders for war crimes. The allies joined in, trying the 22 top culprits at Nuremberg World War Crimes trial during 45 and 46. Accusations included committing crimes against the laws of war and humanity and plotting aggressions uh, contrary to solemn treaty pledges. So the question that we had to answer was, what was the purpose of the Nuremberg War, Bar- Nuremberg War Crimes Trial? Uh, this is, of course, is to weaken the Nazi party in Germany after the war, but as well as punish those Nazi leaders for some of those war crimes that they engaged in. Okay. Justice, Nuremberg style was harsh. Twelve accused Nazis uh, swung from the gallows and seven were sentenced to long, uh, long jail terms. Foxy, Hermann Goring whose blubbery chest had once blazed with ribbons, cheated the hangman a few hours before his scheduled execution by swallowing a hidden cyanide capsule. The trials of this, uh, several small fry Nazis continued for years. Some legal critics in America and elsewhere condemned these proceedings as judicial lynchings because ex- uh, the victims were tried for offenses that had not been clear-cut crimes when the war began. So... Um, of course, once again, these Nuremberg trials are punishing the leaders of the Nazi party. Uh, Hermann Goring, I mean, they're doing this through lynchings. Um, Hermann Goring, of course, I believe, who was the leader of the Air Force, uh, he's able to escape the uh, noose by taking a cyanide pill. Uh, this is criticized by um, some Americans saying that it's unjust because uh, the victims were tried for offenses that had not been clear when the war began. Beyond punishing the top Nazis, the Allies could agree on little about post-war Germany. Some American uh, Hitler haters noting that industrialized Germany had been a brutal aggressor and first wanted to dismantle German factories and reduce the country to a potato patch. The Soviets denied American economic assistance uh, were determined to rebuild or shed our land by extracting enormous reparations from the Germans. Both these desires were clashed headlong with the reality that industrial, healthy German economy was indispensable to was indispensable to the recovery of Europe. A couple of things that you want to make sure you understand here is, of course, um, the only thing that the, the author is claiming is that um, 
great powers, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union this time, and the United States, of course, cannot agree to much. Uh, Soviet unions, uh, Soviet Union, of course, wants to punish Germany, uh, taking as many reparations as possible, right? Uh, but there's some disagreement with that. Along with Austria, Germany had been divided at war's end into four military occupation zones, each designed to one of the big four powers. So Germany split up into four areas. The Western Allies refused to allow Moscow to bleed their zones of other reparations as Stalin insisted that he had been promised at Yalta. Uh, they also began to promote the idea of a reunited Germany. The communists responded, responded by tightening their grip on their eastern zone. Before long, it was apparent that Germany would remain indefinitely divided. Western Germany eventually became an independent country, headed wedded to the West, East Germany along with the Soviet-dominated um, Eastern European countries, such as Poland, Hungary, became nominally independent satellite states bound to the Soviet Union. Eastern Europe virtually disappeared from Western sight behind the Iron Curtain of secrecy and isolation as Stalin clanged down across Europe from Baltic to the Adriatic. This division in Europe would endure for more than four decades. So, of course, uh, Great Britain, United States, they're against Stalin bleeding um, Germany out of the resources. So they go ahead and split Germany into four occupation zones. Um, and at the same time, Stalin is trying to increase his influence in Eastern Europe. Oh, uh, okay. So next question is why was the Berlin airlift necessary? With Germany now split into two, there remained a problem of the rubble heap known as Berlin. Lying deep in the Soviet zone, Soviet zone, this uh, beleaguered isle in a Red Sea had been broken. Like Germany as a whole and the sectors occupied by troops, each of the four victorious powers. In 1948, following controversies over German currency uh, reform and four power control, the Soviets abruptly choked off all rail and access to Berlin. This evidently was a reason that the Allies would be starved out. So uh, Berlin, of course, is going to be split up into different zones. Uh, because it's a capital. Uh, that's just a lot more commerce, more industry, a lot more resources there. Um, what ends up happening is uh, 1948, controversies over German currency reform and a control. Uh, I believe that the West, uh, West Germany was starting to get more developed and at the same time establish um, its own government. Stalin, of course, ends up blocking all access to um, Berlin, that is. Right. Uh, so it's really choked off all rail access to Berlin. Um, so this is really hurting the Allied zone. He wanted to starve them out so they would lose their influence. Berlin became a hugely symbolic issue for both sides. A stake was not only the fate of the city, uh, but a test of wills between Moscow and Washington. The Americans organized the um, gigantic Berlin air, airlift. In the midst of hair trigger tension, for nearly a year, flying some of the very uh, aircraft that recently dropped bombs on Berlin. American pilots buried thousands of tons of supply a day to uh, grateful Berliners, their former enemies. Western Europeans took heart from this vivid demonstration of America's determination to honor its commitments in Europe. The Soviets, their bluff dramatically called, um, by the Lifter blockade in 1949, in the same year, the governments of the two Germanies, East and West, were formally established. The Cold War had easily congealed. So the question was, why did Truman feel as if the uh, Berlin airlift was a necessity? Uh, a couple things. I mean, see, so we're looking at this Berlin airlift, and it's assigned or defined as a year-long mission of flying food and supplies to blockade Western Berliners. Well, here's the thing is, the biggest problem is that West Berlin is... Uh, not able to obtain resources, it's going to be starved out. With it starving out, it's more likely than to support the Soviet Union, which turns mean, which in turns means just supporting communism. So the reason why the Berlin air, the Berlin airlift was important for the moral reason, make sure that the Western Berliners were getting the resources that were blockaded uh, by the Soviet Union, but also to go ahead and contain communism. The Cold War deepens. The Cold War deepens. What was the purpose of the Truman Doctrine? What were some criticisms of the Truman Doctrine? Discuss the provisions of the Marshall Plan and describe the success of the Marshall Plan. What is meant by the Iron Curtain? 
A crafty Stalin also probed West resolved and other sensitive points, including oil rich Iran. Seeking to secure oil concessions, similar to those held by the British and Americans, Stalin 46 broke an agreement to remove his troops from Iran's northernmost province, which in the USSR had occupied during World War II. Instead, he used the troops to aid a rebel movement. Truman sent off a stinging protest and the Soviet dictator backed down. So all in all, you're getting this first paragraph is, of course, Stalin wants to influence over oil-rich Iran. Iran. Moscow's hardline policies in Germany, Eastern Europe, and the Middle East wrote a psychological Pearl Harbor. The eyes of Americans were jarred, wide open by the Kremlin's apparent unwillingness to continue the wartime partnership. Any remaining goodwill from the period of camaraderie in arms evaporated in a cloud of dark distrust. I'm tired of babying the Soviets, Truman remarked privately in 1946. His attitudes on both sides began to harden frostily. So America is, what they mean by wrote of, uh, a psychological Pearl Harbor is America feels as if they're being attacked by the Soviets. Uh, they're upset with the Soviets because uh, they're not really promoting this um, post-World War II peace. Truman's piecemeal responses to various Soviet challenges took on an intellectual coherence in 1947 with the form formulation of the containment doctrine. Crafted by a brilliant young diplomat and Soviet specialist, George F. Keenan, this concept held that Russia, whether czarist or communist, was relentlessly, was relentlessly, relentlessly expansionary. But the Kremlin was also cautious, he argued, in the flow of Soviet power into every nook and cranny available to it could be stemmed by firm and vigilant containment. So what this Truman Doctrine or this containment doctrine means, right, was the doctrine declared the Soviet Union and communism were communist and that they should be contained, right? That American policy should be to contain the Soviet Union as well as communism. Truman embarked Keenan's advice when he formally and publicly adopted a get tough with Russia policy in 1947. His dramatic move was triggered by a word that heavily burdened Britain could no longer bear the financial, the financial military load of defending Greece against communist pressures. If Greece fell, Turkey would presumably collapse and the strategic eastern Mediterranean would pass on to the Soviet orbit. So Truman becomes a little bit threatened because he feels as if, or he hears word that Great Britain can no longer stop and contain uh, influence in uh, communist influence in Greece. Right. And America kind of fears that communism is going to spread all over the Mediterranean. In a surprise appearance, the president went before Congress on March 12, 1947, and requested support from what became known as the Truman Doctrine. Specifically, he asked $400 million to bolster Greece and Turkey, which Congress quickly granted. More generally, he declared that it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by the armed minorities or by outside pressures sweeping open-ended commitment of vast and worsened proportions. Critics then later charged that Truman had overacted by promising unlimited support to any tin horn despot who claimed to be resisting communist aggression. So what we're getting in this Truman doctrine, I'm going to continue reading the paragraph in a second, is that Greece and Turkey looks as if that they're going to turn communist. Communist influence is spreading over there. Truman asked for $400 million to help them fight back communism. And while many want to contain communism, some also fear that are we just going to go ahead and give money to any nation that claims that they are fighting communism. Uh, critics also complained that Truman Doctrine needlessly polarized, polarized the world into pro-Soviet and pro-American camps and wise, unwisely construed the Soviet threat as primarily military in nature. Apologists for Truman have explained that it was Truman's fear of revised isolationism that led to exaggerate the Soviet threat to pitch his message in the charged language of a global of a holy global war against godless communism. So many fear that this was turning the world into uh, a world of pro-Soviet or pro-American, and you had to choose one side. So let's go through here. Um, what was the purpose of the Truman Doctrine? 400 million to stop the spread of communism into Greece and Turkey. The criticism is, well, what are we going to do anytime a country uh, – says that they're fighting communism, are we, going to, are we going to give them money for it? But also some people felt that this was turning the world into uh, capitalism versus communism, or pro-United States versus pro-Soviet. So in some ways it was instilling less peace than more peace. 
Meanwhile, a threat of a different sort loomed in Western Europe, especially France, Italy, and Germany. These key nations were still suffering from hunger and economic chaos spawned by war. They were in grave danger of being taken over from inside by communist parties that would exploit these hardships. President Truman responded with a bold policy in keeping with America's post-war desire for a liberalized global economy. In a commencement address at Harvard University on June 5, 1947, Secretary of State George C. Marshall invited the Europeans to get together and work on a joint plan for their economic recovery. If they did, so then the United States would provide substantial financial assistance. This forced cooperation constituted a powerful nudge on the road to eventual creation of the EC, European community. So you're getting nations such as France, Italy, and Germany. Uh, due to instability, it looked as if they might actually be influenced by the Communist Party. Uh, President Truman responded with the bold policy here. What he does is he uh, invites them to a commencement address uh, where he ends up saying that Secretary of George Marshall, uh, he invites all those European nations to create a joint economic plan to help with this recovery. Um, so what we end up getting is what we call the Marshall Plan. The democratic nations of Europe rose enthusiast enthusiastically to the life-giving bait of the so-called Marshall Plan. Uh, they met in Paris in July 1947 to thrash out the details. There, Marshall offered the same aid to the Soviet and its allies. If they could make political reforms and accept certain outside controls, in fact, the Americans worried that the Russian bear might hug the Marshall Plan to death, and therefore made the plans deliberately difficult for the, for the USSR to accept. Nobody was surprised when the Soviet walked out denouncing the Marshall Plan as one more capitalist trick. So what this Marshall Plan is, it was a plan to transfer aid to post-war Western nations if they met certain requirements. All right. Uh, it's intended to bolster capitalistic and democratic governments. Um, one of the fears that they, we did have was that, of course, is that the Soviet Union might want to take part of it and they're just going to go and hug the United States out of their resources. So therefore, they made it very tough uh, for the Soviet Union to meet these requirements. Right. It was basically a way to the saying is, hey, turn capitalist, turn democratic. Uh, we'll give you money to help uh, with your recovery with the war. Okay. And I just described those provisions. Um, it was a way to help warring uh, or war-torn European nations, having them turn capitalists and communists. In return, they would be given an extreme amount of financial aid. Right? The Marshall Plan called for spending of $12.5 billion over four years in 16 cooperating countries. Congress at first balked at this mammoth sum. It looked even huger when added to the nearly $2 billion the United States had already contributed to Europe. Through the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration and the hefty American contributions to the United Nations, IMF, and World Bank, but a Soviet-sponsored communist coup in Czechoslovakia finally awakened legislators to reality, and they voted initial appropriations in April 1948. Congress evidently concluded that Uncle, Uncle Sam did get the Europeans back on their feet. They would never get off their back. So uh, what pushes Congress to pass this, of course, is Czechoslovakia uh, is taken over by a communist coup, right? Uh, and what is meant in that very last sentence, that if Uncle Sam did knock the Europeans back on their feet, they would never get off his back. So meaning that we put Europe on our back, right? So we're carrying Europe to recovery. Truman's Marshall Plan was a spectacular success. American dollars pumped reviving blood into the economic veins of the anemic Western European nations. Within a few years, most of them were exceeding their pre-war outputs as an economic miracle drenched Europe in prosperity. The communist parties in Italy and France lost ground, and these key tone countries were saved from the westward thrust of communism. So this is very successful. It was very successful because it helped Italy uh, as well as France back on their feet, meanwhile uh, stopping the communist party from gaining ground in power. A resolute Truman made another fateful decision in 1948. Access to Middle Eastern oil was crucial to European recovery program and increasingly to the health of the U.S. economy, given infinite American oil reserves. Yet the Arab oil countries adamantly opposed the creation of the Jewish state of Israel and a British mandate of Palestine. Should Israel be born, a Saudi Arabian leader warned Truman, the Arabs will lay siege into it until it dies of famine. Defying Arab, defying Arab wrath, as well as the objections of his own state and defense departments of the European allies, Truman officially recognized the state of Israel on its day birth in May 14, 1948. 
humanitarian sympathy for the Jewish survivors of the Holocaust ranked among highest reasons. And this did his wishes to prevent Soviet influence in the Jewish state and to retain the support of American Jewish voters. Truman's policy of strong support for Israel would vastly complicate U.S. relations with the Arab world in the decades ahead. So one of the things that Truman also does is to stop, um, is to obtain more access to oil, right? But at the same time is to also hinder uh, Russian influence in the Middle East um, against some of the um, against some of the word of some of his officials. Uh, Truman recognizes the state of Israel, which is going to uh, increase tension with the other Arab nations. America begins to uh, begins to rearm. The passing of the National Security Act provided for the creation of three defense agencies. What were the agen agencies, and what was the purpose of each agency? The Cold War, the struggle between Soviet communism, was not a war. Yet it was not peace. The, stands off, the standoff with the Kremlin banished the dreams of tax fatigued Americans that tanks could be beaten into automobiles. The Soviet menace spurred the unification of the armed services as well as the creation of a huge new national security apparatus. Congress in 1947 passed the National Security Act, creating the Department of Defense. The department was to be was to be housed in a sprawling Pentagon building on the banks of the Potomac and to be headed by a new cabinet officer, the Secretary of Defense. Under the Secretary, but with cabinet status, were the civilian secretaries of the Navy, um, the Army, replacing the old Secretary of War, and the Air Force, the recognition of the rising importance of air power. The uniform heads of each service were brought together as the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The National Security Act also established the National Security Council to advise the president on security messengers uh, and the CIA, Central Intelligence, or, or, yeah, the Central Intelligence Agency, to coordinate the government's foreign fact gathering. The Voice of America, authorized by Congress in 1948, began beaming American radio broadcast behind the Iron Curtain. In the same year, Congress resurrected the military draft, uh, providing for conscription of selected young men from 19 to, uh, from 19 to 25 years of age. The forbidding presence of the selective service system shaped millions of young people's educational, marital, career plans in the following quarter century, one shoe at a time. A weary American was reluctantly uh, returning. To okay, so some of the agencies and organizations that you need to understand. Of course, we're getting the Department of Defense, right? The Department of Defense uh, was housed in the Pentagon. Um, and of course, what it does is, I mean, it focuses specifically on security measures, right? We also end up being the central intelligence urgency to coordinate the government's fact-finding information, right? Of things that might be security hazard. Um, and we're also getting the National Security Council to advise the president on security matters. Uh, so those are some of the agencies that were created during this time. The Soviet threat was forcing the democracies of Western Europe into an unforeseen degree of unity. In 1948, Britain, France, Belgium, and Netherlands and Luxembourg signed a path-breaking treaty of defense alliance at Brussels. They then invited the United States to join them. The proposal confronted the United States with a historic decision. America had traditionally avoided entangling alliances, especially in peacetime. If the Cold War could be considered peacetime, yet American participation in an emerging coalition could serve many purposes. It would strengthen the policy of containing the Soviet Union, it would provide a framework for the reintegration of Germany into the European family, and it would reassure jittery Europeans that the traditional isolationist Uncle Sam was not to abandon them to a marauding Russian bear or to a resurgent and domineering Germany. So looking at this question, this is probably the most important question looking at here, is what was the purpose of NATO? Uh, the purpose of NATO, uh, Northern Atlantic Treaty Organization, um, was uh, just a path-breaking defense treaty. It's almost like a defense alliance, right? Uh, they're inviting the United States to join them, and this is beneficial for the United States in terms of it would uh, go ahead and help us contain the expansionist policies of the Soviet Union. Meanwhile, it was beneficial for us joining because other European nations see that we're assisting them in helping reintegrate Germany into the European family, uh, but also... Uh, provide some protection against um, a 
Nazi Germany that might come back or a domineering Germany, not Nazi Germany, but I guess you could say a more imperialist Germany and also an expanding uh, Soviet Union. The Truman administration decided to join the European PAC called the Northern Atlantic Treaty Organization and thereby granted it a transatlantic character. With the white tie pageantry, the NATO treaty was signed on Washington on April 4, 1949. The 12 original signatories pledged to regard an attack on one as an attack on all, promised to respond with the armed force if necessary. Uh, despite last ditch howls from immovable isolationists, the Senate approved the treaty on July 21st, 1949, by a vote of 82 to 13. Membership was boosted to 14 in 1952 with inclusion of Greece and Turkey to 15 in 1955 with the addition of West Germany. So, as you can see here, the United States is a lot different after. World War II compared to after World War I, because now we are joining treaties. And remember, isolationists were against this because they felt as if it would get us into war. The NATO was um, epochal. It, provided, it marked a dramatic departure from American diplomatic convention, a gigantic boost for European unific unification, and significant step in militarization of the Cold War. NATO became the cornerstone of all Cold War American policy towards Europe. With good reason, Pundits summed up NATO's threshold purpose, or threefold purpose, to keep Russians out, keep the Germans down, and America's in. So the purpose of NATO were those three. Keep Russians out, put the Germans down, and keep America's in. If you attack one nation in NATO, you attack them all. What was the purpose of NATO? Just described it. Reconstruction and, and revolution in Asia. What was significance about Truman's response to Soviet explosion of an atomic bomb? Reconstruction and Revolution in Asia. Uh, what was significant about Truman's response to the Soviet, Soviet explosion of the atomic bomb? Reconstruction in Japan was simpler than in Germany, primarily because it was largely a one-man and one-army show. The occupying American army under Supreme Allied Commander, five-star General Douglas MacArthur, sat in the driver's seat. In the teeth of violent protests from Soviet unions, MacArthur went inflexibly ahead uh, with his program for the democratization of Japan. Following the pattern in Germany, top Japanese war criminals were tried in Tokyo from 1946 to 48. Eight of them were sentenced to prison terms and seven were hanged. General MacArthur, as kind of a Yankee Mikado, uh, enjoyed stunning success. The Japanese cooperated to an astonishing degree. They saw that good behavior and the adoption of democracy would speed at the end of the occupations it did. A MacArthur dictated constitution was adopted in 1946. It renounced militarism, provided for women's equality, and introduced, and introduced Western style democratic government, paving the way for a phenomenal economic recovery that within a few decades made Japan one of the world's mightiest and industrial powers. Ironically, as with the US supported recovery from Western European economies, Japan's post war ascendance eventually helped to end America's honeymoon as the unchallenged global economic kingpin. Despite such ironies, Japan proved an unconscionable post war success for American policymakers. The opposite was true in China, where a bitter civil war had raged for years between national and communists. Washington had half heartedly supported the national government for Generalissimo Jiang Zixi, also known as Chiang Kai shek, in the struggle with the communists under Mao Zedong. But ineptitude and corruption within the Generalissimo regime gradually corroded the confidence of his people. Communist army swept in late 1949. Chiang Kai-shek was forced to flee with the remnants of his once powerful force to the last Hope Island for most of us in this Taiwan. So a couple things. Uh, of course, um, when you're looking at Japan, uh, Japan is punished for what happened in World War II. You're also getting uh, war criminals that are punished. Eight of them were hanged. Uh, and then what you end up getting is this move for a militarization, the second paragraph, to Western-style democracy. Um, and Japan was able to become one of the world's mightiest industrial powers, showing the success of post-World War treaties, but as well as recovery. Um, on the other hand, you're getting China, which is the complete opposite during this time. Uh, within China, you are getting the con 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 uh, continuation of the Chinese Civil War between the Communist Party, led by Mao Zedong, and the Nationalists, led by Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, Mao is very successful. Uh, a lot of it is because of uh, lots of, uh, the lack of support from the capitalists because America kind of refused to provide them the assistance during World War II, uh, delaying much of the 
Asian front of the war to focus on Germany. Um, so keep that in mind. More bad news came in September 1949 when President Truman shocked the nation by announcing the Soviets exploded an atomic bomb. Approximately three years later than many experts had thought possible. America's refused since 1945 had counted on keeping the Soviets in line by threats of one-sided aerial attack with nuclear weapons. But atomic bombing was now the game that two could play. To outpace the weapons, the Soviets in the nuclear weaponry, uh, Truman ordered the development of the H-bomb, a city-smashing thermonuclear weapon that was a thousand times more powerful than the atomic bomb. J. Robert Oppenheimer, former uh, scientific director of the Manhattan Project and current chair of the Atomic Energy Commission, led a group of scientists in opposition to the program to design thermonuclear weapons in the grounds and approached genocide. Albert Einstein, a physicist whose theories had given birth to the atomic age, declared that annihilation of any life on Earth has been brought within the range of technical difficulties and possibilities. So in response to the atomic bomb of Russia, of course, we developed the hydrogen bomb. Right? We're trying to go ahead and develop uh, and maximize our technology to compete with the Soviets. And here you're getting Albert Einstein and as well as Oppenheimer, um, the director of the Manhattan Project, uh, that are kind of opposing this. You know, they're saying that this is approach to genocide, but as well as the annihilation of life on Earth all again. But Einstein and Oppenheimer, the nation's two most famous scientists, cannot dissuade Truman. Anxious over communist threats in East Asia from proceeding with the H-bomb, the United States exploded its first hydrogen device on the South Pacific Atoll in 1952. Not to be outdone, uh, the so Soviets countered with the first H-bomb explosion in 1953. The arms race entered a previously competitive cycle, spurred on by massive state support from defense-related scientific research in both countries. It was, it was only constrained by the recognition that a truly hot Cold War could leave no world for communists to communize or democracies to demo, uh, dem uh, democratize. Peace through the mutual terror brought a shaky stability to the superpower standoff. The Korean volcano erupts. Korea, the land of the morning calm, heralded a new and more disturbing phase of the Cold War, a shooting phase. In June 1950, when Japan collapsed in 1945, Soviet troops had accepted the Japanese surrender north of the 38th parallel Korean Peninsula, and American troops had done likewise south of that line. Both superpowers profess to want unification and independence of Korea, a Japanese colony since 1910. But as in Germany, each helped to set up rival regimes above and below the parallel. So as a result of Japan collapsing, Korea uh, becomes an independent state. And of course, you are getting um, just two different regimes that want to be set up. You get a communist regime and also a more democratic regime. By 1949, when the Soviets Americas had withdrawn their forces, the entire peninsula was a bristling armed camp with hostile regimes eyeing each other suspiciously. The explosion came on June 25, 1950, spearheaded by the Soviet-made tanks. North Korean army uh, columns rumbled across the 38th parallel, caught flat-footed. The South Korean forces were shoved back uh, southward to do a dangerously tiny defensive area around Busan, their wary backs to the sea. President Truman sprang quickly into the breach. The invasion seemed to provide devastating proof of fundamental premise in the containment doctrine that shaped Washington's foreign policy. Even a slight relaxation of America's guard was an invitation to communist aggression somewhere. So, of course, you are getting the um, communist regime of North Korea that is trying to expand into South Korea, right? And they're supported by the Soviets. Um, South Korean forces are trying to push back, and Harry Truman, of course, with his containment policy, uh, becomes very concerned about this. President Truman sprang quickly into the breach. The invasion seemed to provide devastating proof of a fundamental premise in the containment doctrine that shaped Washington's foreign policy. Even a slight relaxation of America's guard was an invitation to communist aggression somewhere. So Harry Truman uh, sees that he needs to be aggressive and fight back the communist regime in North Korea, supported by the Soviet Union. The Korean invasion prompted a massive expansion of the American military. A few months before, Truman's National Security Council had issued its famous 
NSC 68, National Security Council Memorandum Number 68, recommending the United States quadruple its defense spending. Ignoring at first because it seemed politically impossible to implement, NSC 68 got a new lease on life in the Korean crisis. Korea saved us. Secretary of State Atchison later commented, Truman now ordered a massive military buildup, well beyond what was necessary for Korea. Soon, the United States had 3.5 million men in our arms and was spending $50 billion a year on the defense, some 13% of the GDP gross national product. So Truman, as a result of the Korean crisis, calls for an increase in spending of arms. NSC is called NSC 68. NSC 68 was a key document of the Cold War period, not only because it marked a major step in the militarization of American foreign policy, but also because it widely reflected the sense of almost limitless possibility that pervaded post-war American society. NSC 68 rested on the assumption that the enormous American economy could bear without strain the huge cost of a gigantic rearmament program, said one NSC 68 planner. It was practically nothing that the country could, could not do if it wanted to do. Truman took full advantage, advantage of the temporary Soviet absence from the United States Security Council on June 25, 1950, to obtain unanimous condemnation of North Korea's aggressor. Why the Soviet were absent remains controversial. Scholars believe the Soviets were just as surprised as the Americans by the attack. It now appears that Stalin had given his reluctant approval to North Korea's strike, but believed that the fighting would, brief, would be brief and the United States would take little interest in it. Security Council also called upon all UN members, including the United States, to render every assistance to restore peace. Two days later, without consulting Congress, Truman ordered American naval and air naval units to support South Korea. Before the week was out, he also ordered General Douglas MacArthur's uh, based occupation troops into alongside the leader of South Koreans. So began the ill-fated Korean War. So in short, because um, the NSC succeed is passed, we have an abundance of troops. Uh, Truman now calls to uh, attack South, to uh, provide assistance to South Korea and attack North Korea. Officially, the United States was simply participating in the United Nations police action. Participating nations, including Great Britain, Canada, and the Philippines, did make significant troop contributions. But the UN, provide, the United States provided 88% of the UN contingents. And General McCarthy, the UN commander of the entire operations, took his orders from Washington, not from the Security Council. So this is very much led by the United States, not necessarily the United Nations. So uh, what was NSC-68 and how is it represented the expansion of the American military? Well, I mean, it was a security act that was passed after the Korean crisis, and it's called for increased funding in the American military. Um, how does it, was, how was it? I mean, it was represented. I mean, that's what it did. It increased the funding of the military and then it was later used in uh, the Korean War. Discuss how the Korean War is not a was not really a police action. It wasn't really a police action because the United Nations took very little part in it. 88% of the troops were American troops, and Douglas MacArthur didn't take orders from the United Nations. It took orders from um, the United States military, or the, the government, right? So showing it's not a League of Nations policing action. It was more of a policy of containment. The military seesaw on Korea. Rather than fight his way out of the southern Busan parameter, MacArthur launched a daring amphibious landing behind the enemy's line at Incheon. This bold gamble on September 15, 1950 succeeded brilliantly. Within two weeks, North Koreans had scrambled back behind his sanctuary of the 30th parallel. Truman's avowed intention was to restore South Korea to its former borders, but the pursuing South Koreans had already crossed the 38th parallel and there seemed little point in permitting the North Koreans to regroup and come one again. Come again, the UN General, uh, the UN General Assembly, uh, technically authorized a crossing by MacArthur, whom President Truman ordered northward, provided that there was no armed intervention by the Chinese or the Soviet. So during the early stages, the United States military was very successful. As seen here, North Korea scrambled back behind the sanctuary of the 38th parallel, so he was able to push back. Um, North Korea. The Americans thus raised the stakes in Korea, and doing so quickened the fears of another potential plan in a dangerous game. The Chinese had publicly warned that they would not sit idly and watch hostile troops approach the strategic Yellow River boundary between Korea and China. But MacArthur, 
poo-pooed all predictions of an effective intervention by the Chinese and importantly boasted that he would have the boys home by Christmas. Have the boys home by Christmas. So the Chinese feel threatened uh, by the um, support that the United States have provided in pushing back the North Korean army. MacArthur heard badly in November 1950, tens of thousands of Chinese volunteers fell upon rashly overextended lines and hurled the UN forces reeling back down the peninsula. The fight now sank into a frostburn stalemate on the icy ter terrain near the 38th parallel. And Pierce MacArthur, humiliated by this route, pressed for dr drastic retaliation. He favored a blockade of the Chinese coast and bombardment of Chinese bases in Manchuria. He even suggested the United States use nuclear weapons on advancing Chinese or supplies, supply lines. But Washington policymakers with anxious eyes in Moscow refused to enlarge the already costly conflict. The chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff declared that a wider clash in Asia would be the wrong war, the wrong place, the wrong time, and with the wrong enemy. Europe, not Asia, was administration's other first concern, and the USSR, not China, loomed as the most sinister foe. Um, so China is very successful in providing assistance to North Korea. They're able to push back the UN and their troops. Uh, MacArthur becomes very angry. He wants to be more aggressive. In fact, he even suggests that we use nuclear weapons. Um, but of course, this doesn't happen. Uh, the focus said by many should be on uh, Europe, not Asia, which of course does not happen. A foreshadowing Vietnam. Two-fisted General MacArthur felt that he was being asked to fight with one hand behind his back. He sneered at the concept of a limited war and insisted that there is no substitute for victory. Truman bravely resisted calls for nuclear escalation. When MacArthur began to criticize the president's policies publicly, Truman had no, no choice but to remove the insubordinate general from command, which he did on April 11, 1951. In July, truce discussions began in a rude field tent near the firing line, uh, immediately snagged on the issue of prisoner exchange. Talks dragged on unpredictably for two years while men continued to die. Meanwhile, MacArthur alleged his own return to an uproarious American welcome. Whereas in many circles, Truman was condemned as a pig, imbecile, a Judas, an appeaser of communism. The domestic response to the Truman-MacArthur conflict offered just a hint of the deaths of popular passions coursing through the Cold War at home. So uh, Truman ends up firing MacArthur because MacArthur criticizes Truman as being too soft uh, on the Korean War. Uh, so discuss how the Korean War, okay, what role did the Chinese play in the Korean conflict? Uh, they supported North Korea. In fact, they were able to push back uh, the United Nations. 